Good morning. Okay, so this will be the next video in the Ask the CEO series. I'm doing this pretty early in the morning, uh, only because we have a lot going on today, and I, I was worrying about getting this out to you today. So, uh, it's just before 06, and uh, we have a lot of great questions. Uh, by, by time many of you see this this morning, we will have uh, been current. I spoke with OTC yesterday. They confirmed that we were in queue uh, to go current, that we had cleared comments. And uh, as of this morning, I checked, it was around 04, just before 04, we were already uh, pink current. So I'm not going to answer those questions only because it, it, it doesn't say it, it would be silly to do so. Everyone will already realize that we're pink current. So we'll get right to the questions. A lot of good uh, questions. The first question had to do to uh, lockdowns and how working from home might have realized the company some cost savings. Those cost savings, unfortunately, were negated by uh, the shutdowns and how they affected supply chain. For us, there was no, for most uh, uh, industries in the United States, there was no real interruption to supply chain outside of the United States. So uh, for us, a lot of the stuff that comes in through the West Coast and many companies uh, in the United States, uh, <clears throat> The, the closure of the West Coast ports created quite a problem. So there were many ships, and we had several shipments that were off the coast of the United States. I remember I talked to the harbor master and even um, the uh, import agent that we deal with uh, when, when dealing with customs and so forth. They, they told me at one point there were over 100 ships off the coast of, off of California that couldn't come into the United States because they either were uh, not uh, port workers or, or the West Coast was essentially shut down. So we had to um, adjust. So we brought many of the raw materials either in through Port Houston or uh, in Southern Florida or in many cases air freight, uh, which adds an expense. So that offsets the any savings we might have realized by not having to be in a physical office location. Now, everything else uh, for us, I think for H2O, we had some savings there. But understand there's, there, there were other costs that offset that. Um, I know with Boost, there might have been some savings. There was some savings with, um, obviously, UAT um, and Ossifix. Uh, I think Nextcast, unfortunately not Bacter. Um, but they had shared some spaces. So there was a, there was some, um, what we did is we, we shared a lot of stuff, which, which is a benefit of being a conglomerate, if you will, and or strategic partner. Now the, the cost will start to incur again as we go back in, but also don't forget the physical locations for fulfillment. Uh, some are obviously the R and D facilities and a few other places they, they had to remain intact. There's no way to shut that down and move everything and, and so forth. So, uh, same thing with uh, manufacturing for the dreaming company. Those those uh, facilities remained in place. So it was kind of a wash in many cases. But great question, and perhaps um, it, it garnered some insight for the shareholders to understand how things work uh, and how they worked through the pandemic. Uh, next question was about Bacter Scientific. Are they still, are they working on anything else? Yes, there's several things that they have. I think I'm, I mentioned um, what we call PTAC, which is an infection detection device uh, for a catheter system. There's a few other things they're working on. I don't want to get into that right now. Uh, that, and UAT is involved in helping uh, some of that along. And then um, there's, there are some synergies between uh, Bacter uh, and also UAT, but also some of the other companies. And I'll get into that in, in future videos. I think Many people will see, uh, uh, see some benefit there. And, and again, going back to cost savings, it, it, there's a cost savings associated with that. This next question is about acquisitions. Uh, they want to know <clears throat> what industries we're pursuing. You know, uh, the real answer is all of them, right? All industries are of interest. There are, I'm not going to get into specifics, and I think the person recognizes that in the question. I think they even stated that, but the there are several that we are currently fielding, uh, a few that are uh, coming to the conclusion as far as due diligence and even potential negotiations. 
I'll keep you aware of that. We're, I'm not going to make any announcements ahead of an official press release. Release, sorry, but we 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 are moving along. There, there's nothing, you know. I, I understand the whole getting current, uh, but there's a difference between operational, you know, operations, and then the public uh, side of what our responsibilities are. Those are two separate um, paths, and they 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 operate concurrently or, or side by side. So we're still moving this along uh, along the audits and the S one but also, uh, you know, the business model, and that's part of the business model. So uh, I hate to give a general answer, of, you know, say everything, but that really is the case. There are specific industries that we are targeting uh, only because of a need right now, but I think it wouldn't be wise to get into that um, today or in this video. But in the future, and probably in the near future, we'll have a little more information or I'll be in a position to a little more insight. Um, next question <clears throat> was uh, okay. So this was about uplisting, and just to make a clear, this was more of a clarifying question. Did I mean Q go to the New York or uplisting by Q two of twenty twenty two? And and yes, we we have somewhere around a, a nine month window. Uh, scheduled to uh, to affect, I'm going to say around seven months of of um, processes. Let's put it that way. So we have to complete the audits. We have to uh, package the S1. A lot of it's done already, and then because the audits are a part of that package for the S1, and then we have to submit the S1 and then go through the comments as we did with OTC. Those should go a little smoother only uh, only because of what's happened with OTC. The delay was not necessarily um, uh, part of a typical process with OTC. They were heavily inundated. Uh, it's the time period and some deadlines imposed by uh, the SEC and, and companies uh, making a rush. And it also, <clears throat> to be fair, most companies aren't filing 30 months of disclosures and financials, so they worked. Uh, they were they were very good. Uh, I have to say that they were they were they they're, they communicated with us and they were very um, uh, helpful uh, in in working through the process with us. So I think SEC will, in some ways, go similar similarly, but I do think um, it should move through as expected within a certain time frame. So uh, the next question was in reference to corporate uh, policies regarding uh, vaccinations and testing. Uh, concerned about the Delta variant uh, slowdown due to staffing issues because of unvaccinated staff members. So, <clears throat> you know, this is an interesting question. The the problem for me answering this question is I have a little more insight than than most uh, with our relationship with the federal government, uh, you know, working with certain agencies, CDC, DHS, and uh, other agencies. So I, I, I may have a different uh, vantage point uh, when, when discussing this. I, I'm not concerned. I'll be very forthright. I'm not concerned about variants. I think most people in the industry, you would understand uh, once you talk to them, are not concerned about that. I understand that's a thing going around. Um, but that's more of a, uh, well, we'll leave it at that. But anyway, so uh, we don't impose mandatory vaccines. Uh, it, it's had no effect on us whatsoever. Uh, the proof is in the pudding, right? So in the middle of a pandemic, uh, one of our subsidiaries launched um, a skincare line, and it has been hugely successful. So we actually made gains uh, when most people were shutting down or, ceasing operations, we actually expanded operations. It, it did not affect any, any staff members here in any company, even those of us who contracted uh, COVID just worked through it for the most part. There were a few, uh, few of us that uh, it, it may have affected a little more severely than others, but nothing was close to what you might suspect, and everyone just essentially worked through it. So it has no effect on us. 
Uh, and as far as uh, policies here, uh, we've just proceeded uh, as usual. And that's why we are where we are uh, today. Um, and I think um, I think you, you'll real I think you'll see that with a lot of companies that might have been the case. And, and but you know I think some of the reports might focus more on those that it affected. And there are a lot of people that were affected by that in a negative way. I should say negatively. Some people benefited from it, uh, which is unfortunate to say that, but that, that is the reality of the situation. The next question was uh, asking for an overview on personnel. I'm not going to get, get, they asked about Candace, uh, obviously that she's the, interacts with the public uh, the most. Um, the, as far as a core group, we're not going to get into specific employees. I don't know that that would make some people comfortable, <laughs> you know. So what I will say is that we do have, you know, as far as UATG, there's a core group, of course, but there are core groups within each organization. And maybe down the road, we'll get into some in introducing some of those people in videos. Uh, for the most part, those people will most likely remain behind the scenes. UATG, no, so this actually brings up something very interesting. UATG staffing, specific to UAT group. I know we, a lot of shareholders refer to it as the ticker symbol, but the group is, we're going to try to keep that a skeleton crew for the most part to keep costs down. I view UAT group, its purpose to be in support of uh, subsidiary operations so that they can report up and, and return a value add uh, to the public organization or to the holding company. So we we'll keep probably keep that part, but we'll we'll see. Maybe we can get into a few more things. We're, we unfortunately were unable to date to do a couple of. We've scheduled several times a video with Tom uh, and a few others, but it's just been getting current and moving through the audits. It's been very time consuming. So uh, we'll we'll get to it. I promise we'll get to, we'll get to something along those lines. This is asking about the Dreaming Company. I'll probably expand on this question a little bit, but let's get through the question. Um, what the, the dreaming company received as far as preferred series shares and the valuation of how that was determined. So all subsidiaries, and I think we'll probably go through this on the uh, Q2 video, which will be coming up probably within 30 days, we'll say. So the valuation of the preferred series, and I know why they're asking the question. So the implication is that we've targeted a specific price point and can they extrapolate from that a projected price per share. We're not going to get into that. So but what I will say is um, we have assigned a value on all preferred series shares. Now, you have to do that when raising capital, let's say, as an example. So when we work with institutional investors, we would not we're not in a position to issue common shares. A company can't do that. What we can do is assign or allocate preferred series shares for the purposes of institutional investment or, or a capital raise, which we have done uh, for several preferred series uh, down the road when, when we up those. Right? So the preferred series, um, we, we targeted a lot for either capital raise or acquisitions. And, and this is done in stages, so it's, this gets a little complicated, but we had to assign a value so that we can report a value when we do our filings. How that, no, the, or I should say, how those numbers get determined are based on what their purpose is for. And there's a long-term view on that, so we won't get into specifics. That is a great question, by the way, and I, and I understand why you want to know. But I think that's going to be a better question either for the Q2 video or right after it. So, uh, but I, I do want to answer that question. Each preferred series is evaluated for a specific function or purpose. So, uh, but it is, a, it is a good question. And it also helps shareholders determine what we're paying for. 
one of the reasons I like using shares is when you do an acquisition and you're going to bring a company in, we, we can either pay cash, right, or we can pay equity, or we can do a hybrid. And for me, I think the hybrid is the best way. Cash allows a company to, to be infused with capital uh, for operations, let's say, and then focus on the equity. It's almost, in many ways, a de facto pay for performance. So they are tied to the success of the holding company, which ties them to the success of the conglomerate. So the reason I did it this way was to make sure that all subsidiaries are working together, or I should say that they're, they're incentivized to work together towards the better good, for lack of a better term, because we want the holding company to realize a value for what it, what it uh, expended. So for us, the better all subsidiaries do, the share, not only shareholder value should be uh, augmented, but also as a whole, the organization it realizes uh, an ameliorated uh, value, right? And, and I understand shareholders are gonna focus on price per share, but there's other value for the company. Uh, IP, uh, the ability to deliver on certain technologies and or products, uh, and, and also just capabilities across the board. So there's a reason I, I, I structured and will continue to structure all of our acquisitions a specific way. They'll vary from company to company, um, but for the most part, I really favor this type of structure. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight into uh, that. But I, I, I do realize that we haven't got into the, speci the specificity of that question, but we will. So don't forget that question. And if I miss it in the future, uh, take me to task on it. Definitely remind me, okay? So uh, this one is about the New York Stock Exchange price requirement. Uh, their understanding is that it's $4 a share. Will we get there organically or we uh, will have to be adjusted? Uh, this is, uh, okay. what if share price doesn't meet requirements at time of S1 and audits are done? Okay, so this is essentially asking me again if we're going to do a reverse split. So this is just another way of asking that question. Um, also, the premise of the question is flawed in that their understanding is that it's $4 a share. That's not, that's not accurate. The, how this works, and I, I believe in the shareholder letter, I go into a little more depth with this. But we'll do it right now. So the the requirements as far as minimums, the New York Stock Exchange, there there's not just one, by the way. So for us, uh, and in most instances, it's between two and three dollars a share. Now I know what everyone's going to say, so hear me out. It's two or three dollars depending on um, what standard you list on. So there are five standards, one through four, and then there's four A and B, right? And then you have uh, three options that you have to that have criteria that you need to meet. So for us, we are going to, as of right now, uh, we, out of the five standards, we probably are hitting around three of them, uh, minus the price per share. And then the options, we probably are hitting two of those three. So we're, we're on track, we're okay to move forward. So that's the first point. As far as adjusting, again, this is just another way of asking uh, reverse split. Are we gonna do one? So I, I don't think I have made, uh, there's no mystery on what I, you know, my opinion on, on that particular corporate action. I, I'm not against them. I, if it's something that it is prudent to do so at the time, uh, and we are gonna stay on calendar as a result of, and it's gonna benefit the shareholders to do so, and it's gonna be executed in a way that is responsible and in everyone's best interest in, in a professional way, then I would consider that it has to be a benefit. Now, uh, there are ways to do that. I'm not gonna get into those specifics. I think it would be to do that right now, but because the, there's a lot of variables that go into that. Now, if you're just going to do a reverse split, 
the way most of the companies uh, they, that, or I should say, the way that's typically done uh, in the public markets at this level, then that's easy to do. Uh, and it can be done with the stroke of a pen, uh, in, you know, a week or less. The, but that's if you have uh, an agenda with an eye towards uh, just a financial benefit to, to uh, the company without taking into consideration shareholders and also the long-term viability of the company. Uh, so that's why I have made the statements I've made in the past about uh, these these corporate actions. So I don't want to get into percentages. I just feel that the vast majority of those executed are uh, just completely abused. They're, they're abusive in nature and they're unprofessional. So uh, my opinion of those stand. I understand why you're asking the question though. Do I feel we're going to get there organically? Do I feel we need to do this? I don't want to get into to forward-looking statements. My opinion of, the, of that particular corporate action and actually several others uh, stands, uh, as I have said previously. But I would consider it uh, like I would consider all options made available to me as the chief executive uh, and as a public entity, provided it made sense. So if you're going to do one of these things and then issue huge blocks of stock, that's not going to benefit anyone. And I know that there are several, actually quite a few people have been called me, you know, calling for one. And I appreciate that because I think those people actually understand if it's done correctly, there's a huge benefit. I, I get that. Uh, so, but let's focus on today. And if something becomes necessary in the future, I'll discuss it with you. There's not going to be this, um, uh, this uh, rush to make a, a rash decision based off of what we feel is happening right now or what we you know, think is going to happen. No one has a crystal ball. I understand I sit in different vantage points, so I have an idea of what's happening in the company. Uh, but, you know, we'll get there and let's see how it goes. Uh, again, we're going to stay on calendar at all costs and we're going to do what's in the long term best interest, not of just you know, not just of the solvency of the company, but also shareholders. And then if we do something like that, then I think we need to have a discussion as a group, by the way, because a lot of people, they don't even, they, they, everyone says they understand it, but they, they don't, uh, mainly because they have a certain experience in the markets with that. So we'll get to that in the future. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that. That question has been asked many, many times, um, no matter how many ways you ask it. So, uh, but I'll answer them every time you ask. Is the uplisting process still on schedule? Short answer, yes. Uh, do we want to hear about suggestions or do you have enough on your plate? I am always open to suggestions. So if you have a product suggestion, if you think we've missed something, do please don't be of the mindset that we, we think of everything. We, we do a pretty good job here of thinking is, you know, trying to cover all the bases. But if you think you have an idea and you're a shareholder in this company, then I don't know why you would hold it back, right? We're, we're on the same side. We're all working together. So it's our company as a collective, right? Uh, so yes, send me whatever suggestions you have, all right? But this one's about uh, this particular shareholder doesn't feel that uh, everyone really understands the Dreaming Company acquisition, uh, how much, uh, he's saying how huge it really was or how significant. It's not just a company that rebrands products, um, but a complete vitamin supplement manufacturer. Uh, maybe they want us to expand on that. I, I thought that was understood. I'm surprised at this question, uh, but no, we don't. These are not OEM products, or what, what they're identifying as a rebranded product. We blend. Uh, we are the manufacturer of record for. The, the Dreaming Company, he's also referring to the subsidiary of the Dreaming Company, HBC. They they manufacture the supplements. So I, I've mentioned this several times, or I've made reference to it as well. We bring in raw materials, hence the supply chain question. We had to bring things in from other ports or air freight. And then we manufacture in-house. We're actually moving towards uh, UAT, and this is not just with the Dreaming Company, It'll be with all companies. UAT will start doing all of the manufacturing 
um, or as much of the manufacturer. Let me make that statement. I don't want to appreciate that. The the UAT will be doing most of the manufacturing for all subsidiaries, and then also a lot of the fulfillment. So we're moving towards being able to manufacture not just uh, nutritional supplements, medical devices, even certain uh, materials. We, we'll be working with our subsidiaries like Osifix on being, being a tissue agent so we can sell a cortical bone and, and so forth. We are working on a plan to execute on that so that our own facilities, I'm gonna say our UAT, uh, facilities of manufacturing. So you look at injection molding, vacuum forming, uh, a lot of the different tooling necessary, man, you know, manufacturing the tooling, so forth, and then full machine shop manufacturing uh, and fulfillment uh, processes and, and even the equipment to do that within UAT. So uh, an example might be the packaging. That's something that I want to bring in-house. Packaging has always been a delay for us because we go outside and then we have to prototype it and then they send it in and we go back and forth several times. I would like to bring all of that process uh, under one roof so that we can prototype the difference. You know, why would we do that? Why would we incur that expense? Give you an example. When we were doing packaging for Clearview, that packaging took almost six months. Well, when we were doing things in Texas, we were able to put out prototypes within hours. And then I can improve or uh, make comments in reference to changes that I'd like to see. And we can prototype those. Same thing with labeling and everything else. So there's a lot of different equipment associated with that. And I like to have all that in-house. So that's what we're going to do. So we'll, we'll get that. When do I expect that? Because this can be the obvious question. I expect over the next, it'll be a, pro, a slow build. But over the next 24 months, you'll see the expansion of uh, manufacturing under the UATG uh, conglomerate, most of which will be in UAT. You'll see that, especially with H2O, we're gonna be bringing a lot of things over to Florida out of uh, Denver, and uh, even with Nextcast and Vactor, uh, there's some logistical nuances with some you know, different companies. So there's a lot of fulfillment and, and staged in different parts of the country, but for the most part, I like to see a majority of it uh, here in Florida under UAT. So I hope that answers the questions. Uh, the video's gone a little longer than I like. I, I said it pretty much every video, but I, it's a very busy day. Uh, hopefully everyone will see that we're pink hurt when they wake up in the morning and they get uh, started on their day. And then we can move on to the next stage, which is completing the audits. And they will push the S1 out and then we'll be moving on sometime in Q2. My expectation is sometime in Q2 we would put the um, application in for the New York and we would move forward uh, with that. So in the meantime, it'll go back to business as usual uh, and we will continue expanding on the operations of each subsidiary. We've got some really exciting things coming up. Uh, I'm going to focus on a few other things in, in some other future videos pertaining to different companies and I, I think it's going to give shareholders a better understanding of what this year really is about. I know I've said it in previous videos, but we're really focusing on structure so that we can uh, build on that foundation for 2022 and really expand and really get into growing uh, or focus on those growth, you know, the revenues uh, for 2022. All right, hope everybody has a great day. Got a lot of things happening. And then Friday, hopefully I have some pretty good updates, a few things I'm working on. And uh, hope everybody has a great day. Thank you.